Gallarhorn. One single name that every Destiny player has a strong reaction to. Those that didn't get it in the beginning of Destiny will cringe at their lack of foresight. Those that had it drop for them randomly will smile, remembering their adrenaline pumping from getting so goddamn lucky. And those who had neither the foresight or luck will curl up into a ball and cry at its mere name because this f***ing goddamn piece of sh mother f***ing video game, I'm not salty, you're salty! Oof. Even those who haven't played Destiny personally may even know the name Gallarhorn, as it has transcended the game which originally birthed it. So many emotions for one rocket launcher, but take away all those emotions and ask yourself, how powerful is it really? Like, how much energy is released when one of its rockets blows up in a dreg's face? Have you ever wondered? Well, today, I am going to answer that exact question with some simple, effective physics, and I think the answer might blow your mind. This is a much simpler problem than the last couple ones I tackled in previous Destiny Physics videos. So let's have a little fun with it. Go ahead and guess how powerful you think the Gallarhorn explosion is. Go ahead, take your time, I'll wait. Make your answer relative, like three frag grenades or 20 pounds of C4 or whatever. Hell, even Google the power of a normal rocket launcher, just ballpark it. Got it? Okay, now put your answer in a comment. So I'll bet you $2 that the actual answer will be less than your guess. So now that that's out of the way, how do I intend to prove the actual power of the explosion? First, we have to define what we mean by power. The magnitude of an explosion is measured in units of energy, like joules or tons of TNT, and is called the explosive yield. So that's what we'll do. We can make a very accurate estimate of an explosive yield by simply looking at an explosion and measuring just a couple characteristics. This approach is called the Sedov-Taylor approximation, and it was first used by G.I. Taylor when he used it to calculate the yield of the Trinity test, the very first atomic bomb test in the US. All of it based off just a few pictures of the explosion. His approximation was accurate to within 10% of the true value of the explosion, before the value was even unclassified, which is pretty damn impressive given he just had a few pictures. The equation that Taylor used is pretty simple. E is equal to R to the fifth times rho air over T squared. Here, E is the energy yield of the explosion, what we're looking for. R is the radius of the blast wave at a given time. Rho air is the ambient density of air, which is a constant 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. And T is the time at which you measure the radius. So in other words, in order to measure the explosive power of the Gallarhorn, we simply need to measure the radius of the explosive blast wave and take the time from when the explosion started to that measurement point. Pretty simple. Okay, so I fell down a rabbit hole and I guess it seems like I told you a fib. The method I described to you, the very same one I was taught in my undergrad, is actually not how Taylor calculated the blast, but it is very similar. Apparently this is a sort of physicist's old wives tale. The difference is, rather than just picking an arbitrary time and radius, he plotted it on a log-log scale and fit r to the 5 t to the negative 2, which was a straight line. So I fell down this rabbit hole after reading Taylor's paper and tried to figure this all out, and I suggest anyone interested to click through my sources. But for reasons I'll reveal in a bit, doing it this way is impossible in this case anyways, and the method I discussed will work for our purposes. So let's look at some Gallarhorn blasts. Now, unfortunately, I'm impatient, so I'm doing this before the Gallarhorn drops in D2, which means we have to go back and take the data from D1, which means that we're only working with, at best, 30 frames per second. This means that our temporal resolution will be only half as good as we could get in D2. This shouldn't be too much of a problem, though. It just means we won't have too many points to measure during each blast. So let's get to measuring. 
First, we need to get the conversion factor between pixels and meters, as I've done in previous videos, so we can measure something we know the height of. In this case, a dreg makes an excellent choice. Since we know they're about six feet tall, or 1.828 meters, and since the explosion centers around them, meaning they're both the same distance away from us, we know that we don't need to do any funky trigonometry to get the radius of the blast. The dreg measures about 156 pixels tall, which gives us a conversion factor of 85.34 pixels per meter. Great. For our radius measurement, we'll start with the earliest frame that the spherical blast wave is visible. After viewing multiple blasts, it consistently appears to be about two frames after the rocket hits the target. First, in the explosion, you see a bright flash of light, and then two frames later, you see the blast wave starting to expand outwards. So two frames at 30 frames per second is about 0.0667 seconds. Then, if we draw a circle around this blast wave and measure the radius, we get a result of about 300 pixels, which, using the conversion factor, makes it about 3.51 meters. Okay, great. And just like that, we're ready to plug in the numbers to get the power of the explosion. And our explosive yield is 149,824 joules, or about 150 kilojoules. Seems like a lot, but if we convert it into tons of TNT, that makes it about 0 0.0000358 tons of TNT. We can see how that compares to other exp- Oh. That's right on par with a- Roman candle? Roman candle. Oh, well, excuse me, it's like- two Roman candles, two whole Roman candles, or about a quarter of an average hand grenade. Okay, so you can go ahead and send me the two dollars you all owe me from your bets. Uh, the address is P.O. Box Suck It Noobs, uh, postal code 69420. But really though, this makes no sense. Could you imagine six guardians shooting Roman candles at Crota? Well, Okay, no worries. Let's just try it at a different point in time, like later on in the explosion. Maybe this was just a fluke. So two frames later, which equates to 0.132 seconds total, the radius is about 478 pixels, or 5.6 meters. Plugging this into our explosive yield equation gives a result of about 387 kilojoules, or 9.25 times 10 to the negative five tons of TNT. Okay, so like six to seven Roman candles now. Great. So what the hell went wrong? Well, obviously I wrote this script ahead of time, so I already know. I just wanted you to understand how stumped I was by this for a while. The first thing we can check for issues is the velocity of the blast wave, which is basically just how fast the sphere is growing over time. If we look at the first measurement, we can see that in two frames, or 0 0.0667 seconds, it grew to 3.51 meters, which using our equation velocity equals distance over time, gives us a velocity of about 52 meters per second, or 116 miles per hour. Might seem fast, but that's actually really, really slow. The speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second or 761 miles per hour. So like seven times faster than our blast. Normal real world blast waves are, well, a lot faster than that. Quite a bit faster than the speed of sound, at least at first, but then they start to slow down over time. So since the explosive energy is directly related to its speed, remember that's R over T, it makes sense that the energy would be so low. But hang on, what if we measure the rest of the points and plot it on a graph? What would that look like? Well, like this. It's very close to a straight line. I, I went ahead and did a couple other measurements of different clips, and as you can see, all the data is pretty consistent, which tells us this wasn't some fluke. The velocity of the blast wave starts out at about 50 meters per second, but then slows down and basically stays constant thereafter at around 30 meters per second. 
This gives a roughly linear relationship between time and radius. In other words, radius is directly proportional to time, which is not how real explosions work. Built into Taylor's approximation, r to the power of 2.5 is proportional to t, not directly r to t as we see in our measurements, which basically means that as t increases more and more, the rate that r expands begins to slow way down until it completely stops expanding and eventually dissipates. Clearly, these explosions have fundamentally different behaviors. So while this does mean that our explosion calculation isn't quite accurate since they don't behave in the same way as real-world explosions, the extremely low blast wave velocity means that whatever the actual answer is, it's extremely low, like a Roman candle. So that's kind of anticlimactic. But hang on, why is it this way? Why did Bungie code in these weak-ass explosions? Well, if the blast wave traveled as fast as it does in real life, then most likely between the first frame of the bright flash of light and the first spherical blast wave frame, the wave would expand so much in that time that it would be larger than the entire screen. Unless, I guess, you were standing way far back. Needless to say, that wouldn't look good at all. You'd basically just fire a rocket and then see a bright light and then another bright light, and then it would just disappear. That would look even less like a real explosion than what we see in the game, so I guess what they programmed is the better of two options. They just coded a slow explosion and hoped that some asshole like me wouldn't use physics to try finding something as trivial as this. Sorry guys. So anyways, thanks to all my patrons- Hang on, hang on. What about the Wolfpack rounds? Who the f are you? How, how did you get into my house? Just don't worry about that. What about the Wolfpack rounds? That's what makes a galley shot a galley shot. Okay, okay, I'll talk about the Wolfpack rounds, all right? So I was kind of trying to avoid this, but I wasn't really able to find any good clear footage of the Wolfpack rounds going off, since they're usually exploding around the same time as each other or the main explosion. However, based on what we learned about the speed of the explosions and how that affects their yield, it might generously double the explosive yield at best. So two to four Roman candles tops. Are you happy now? No. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, well, f you. So thank you for watching. I'll do a follow up on this video whenever the D2 Callerhorn is released. It won't be as long as this because I've already explained everything here, but maybe we'll get different results. Who knows? At the very least, I can test more than a few points since we'll have more frames. Until next time, Guardians. No, but but what about the wolf backgrounds? I was gonna I was gonna try to ad lib something there and it didn't <laughs> work. It was, it was dumb. Hold up, hold up. What about the no, but, but what about the Gallahorn shot? It, it's what makes a galley shot a, a galley shot. The wolf background. Fucking shit. <laughs> what did I say? You said the galley shot. It's what makes a galley shot a galley <laughs> shot. <laughs>